It was interesting. We were on vacation last week, so thanks for holding the fort down. And our, our family started to do a, like almost a tally of how many dad things that I said in the car, right? Just, <laughs> just stupid things that you realize like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I, I'm that person. I'm not saying that, right? You drive into a construction zone and you're like, oh, they're working hard on something. You know, just, just stupid stuff, right? Just stupid stuff. So dads are awesome. Dads are awesome. The title of my sermon today, we are going to finish our series on Habakkuk next week, or Habakkuk, or however you want to say it. We'll do that next week. Um, but I want to preach to dads, about dads, about men. But the issue that I want to talk about today is a much bigger issue than just with dads and men. So everybody will be able to get something out of this. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Mark chapter 6, uh, verse 1. We'll get there in just a uh, Second. Um, but before I really get started into this, um, I'm pretty rough on guys because I'm a guy and I think guys can handle it. So if any guy ever takes this message home and goes, see, and tries to use it against somebody else, don't you dare do that. But the first thing that dads need, we're going to just talk about two things that dads need. Dad need dads, fathers need to be honored. And we have this issue in society of being dishonorable to people, and it is ruining us all. Let's look at Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. And this is a really interesting little story in the gospel. And here's what it says. It's up on the screen. I'll read it. You can pull out your phone or your own Bible if you do not believe me. But here's what it says. Jesus left that part of the country, turned with his disciples to Nazareth, his, home, Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. They go, where did he get all this wisdom and all this power to perform miracles? Then they scoffed and go, he's just a carpenter. The son of Mary, brother James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, his sisters even still live here with us or among us. They, they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them this, a prophet is honored everywhere except his hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them, except to place his hands on a few people, a few sick people, and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. What a crazy story. Here is Son of God in flesh, creator of the universe, comes back to his hometown. And because of their attitude towards him, it kept Jesus from doing what Jesus does best. They kept him from doing what Jesus does best. So my question to you today is simply this. If Jesus is hindered by doing what he does best, and he is the Son of God, how much more are we impacted by some of the same attitudes? Could our households, our families, our husbands, our country as a whole be hindered by this attitude and issue of dishonor. Before we get into the nitty gritty and make it personal and make us all uncomfortable, look at this big picture wise. <clears throat> I, bought, I popped a bunch of uh, like allergy meds, so hopefully my throat isn't too scratchy. But think big picture wise. When you talk about political leaders, how do we talk about them? How do we talk about it? Is it Bush, Biden, Obama, Trump, or is it President Obama? Is it President Biden? Is it President Bush? Is it President Trump? Are we, how do we talk about them? Are we honoring people that deserve to be honored because of the position they're in? Or do we automatically dishonor them if they don't view things the same way we do? Now, is it superintendent, or is it just his last name, right? Is it Principal Jones, or is it just Jones? See what? What is it? What is it? And this is a huge problem. This is a huge problem in church circles. This is a huge problem in the world. This issue of dishonor, especially, especially when we get into the nitty gritty of people that we do not agree with. Right? We're cool with honoring people that we agree with because you're like, see, they deserve to be honored. But 
But if they vote different than you do, if they have different morals and moralities than you do, we immediately go to the issue of dishonor. And I'm not even saying that everybody in leadership deserves to be in leadership, or everybody in leadership positions is honorable, or they have biblical beliefs, or any of it. I'm simply asking the question, if dishonor hindered Jesus from doing what Jesus does best, and transforming lives, how much more is it still impacting us today? Is it, is it hindering organizations, families, churches, our entire country, because of the attitude that a lot of people in the church tends to have? And here's what can happen in all circles of life. Leadership tries to be real, authentic, open, honest with things, and because we do not honor the position that they're in, we end up turning it back on them. You ever see this? You realize this? You go, your boss tries to be open with how the company or the organization is going, and instead of honoring their openness and their being authentic and honesty, you look at them and you begin to go, I can do that job better than he can. I can do that, that's easy to do. And the church world is notorious for this. We just disguise it in different cliche words. Right? We disguise it as godly wisdom. We disguise it as, as God trying to just show up and, and help us. But in all reality, is, is it's just a roundabout way of dishonoring people in leadership. Now, we do this in all areas of life, not just work, or not just work, not just home, not just church. You ever walk into a doctor's office and think to yourself, I know exactly what's wrong with me, and I know exactly how the doctor should treat me? Right? We do these things all the time. And on this Father's Day, I think we need to do a much, much better job of honoring people that deserve to be honored. And as adults, if we do not lead better in this issue of honor, there's no way that the next generation will ever honor anybody else. Why should we ever expect a bunch of 13-year-olds to honor the principal and the teacher when we're not doing it at home? It's our fault. So this issue of honor goes way deeper than just simply honoring dads and fathers, and that's really what I want to talk about today. But this issue of honor goes way deeper. It goes way, way deeper. Honor. Honor is, though, the main love language of most men. And here's, if you talk to a guy, if their spouse talks to their husband, it has to be done in an honorable way. See, we don't want to admit it, man, but we're pretty emotionally sensitive. We don't like it, but it's true, right? My wife, Tina, she bruises easily. She'll run to the couch. The next thing you know, it's like, where did you get that? She's like, oh, I ran to the couch like four days ago. Like, oh, okay. But just like women can sometimes bruise, we bruise emotionally via the way different people talk to us. Because of what I do for a living, I have this really bad habit. I eavesdrop. Anybody else with me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? You're out in public and you eavesdrop on every conversation you hear. I call it people watch. <laughs> <laughs> okay? We do it. We do it. We eavesdrop. And one of the things that I've seen happen so much, and we do it under the disguise of venting or getting it all out or safe places or whatever it is, but we dishonor so many people. And I've heard so many people rip apart their spouses, both men and women, and we're dishonoring. What we're doing is we are shooting ourselves in the foot. We want somebody to change but we're going about it the entirely different way and we're undercutting what God really wants to be able to do in said situation because of the dishonor that we are showing them. I get it. I get it. Maybe you're like, well, this is what I've seen. I was like, I know. I'm there with you. So it's hard sometimes to preach messages because I'm sitting there going, ah, yeah, I thought I'd watch that one. But let me tell you, men need to be honored. And there's ways to be able to do it. Men need to be honored just like women need to know that they have security. 
right? Women need to know that you have security, right? Because if your husband is always threatening divorce, guess what? You're just going to check out and be like, forget you. Women need security. Men need to be honored. We need that. We need it. Man's honor is a man's number one need. It's not the other thing. Honor is a man's number one need. How we speak to him. We'll look at some things that caused dishonor. Jesus shows up at his hometown and they know him. Familiarity. And when you know somebody, you know somebody. And you know all the good and all the bad. And they knew all the good and all the bad about Jesus. And I think one of the interesting things that I, there's not a lot written on about it, but I always find interesting is the human side of Jesus. Because Jesus was fully God and Jesus was fully human. So he shows up to his hometown and these guys just know the guy that grew up there. Hey, we know this guy. He's an average carpenter at best. I don't know. I mean, he's probably pretty good. He's still Jesus. Like, he's got me beat. Like, you know what I mean? Like, okay? Let's not get this thing twisted. Like, he definitely knew how to use a hammer. Like, okay? But here he just shows up like, this dude's just a carpenter. Can you imagine if you're a dad? Right? Because Jesus never sinned, but it doesn't mean he wasn't a normal teenager. So he's hanging out as a teenage boy with other teenagers, and he starts saying hi to your teenage daughter. It's not sinful to say hi and be kind and polite. But every day when this happens to their teen, when their daughters get old enough, they immediately go get the shotgun and start cleaning it. <laughs> but so can you imagine Jesus coming back to the same hometown and going, wait a minute, I know this kid. This is the kid that was awkward that was trying to speak and gave to my daughter, but it never worked or whatever. Like, he just had a normal life. And so they would have seen him as just a normal person, is what I'm saying. They had so much familiarity with him that they couldn't get past it. That's why this idea of dads need to be honored is so crucial, because every household knows every horrible thing your dad has ever done. Right? Every time you blow up, you remember it. Okay? Every time. Why? Because we're familiar with each other. We're familiar with each other. You remember it and you know it. You're like, yeah, I've seen him at his worst and I've seen him at his best. I remember that day and I remember this day and I remember that day. The people in Jesus' hometown, it was the same mentality and the same attitude. They were familiar with Jesus. And because they were so familiar with him, they went, there's no way that this guy is the son of God. There's no way. Yeah, he's kind of smart. He's got some good one-liners. He can come into the synagogue and say some smooth words and everything else, but there is no way the kid that we remember being eight years old running the street is that same kid that's the, now claiming he's the son of God. There is no way that it's that kid. In fact, I remember when we tried to go, we all had to go on a trip together as a city, and this kid ran away from home. So I, we remember all this stuff. We're like, there's no way we're letting my daughter date this kid. He runs away from home. We remember all these things. They were familiar with Jesus. And then the familiarity with Jesus caused them to dishonor Jesus. And when you're close to somebody, I mean close to somebody, it's really hard. Or it can be really, really hard to honor them all the time. This is why celebrity culture is so addictive. Because it's really easy, right, to honor somebody from far away. It's really easy for the younger, young people to athletes, YouTube stars, and all this stuff, and all those old people are like, stop looking up to YouTube people. You know, it's like, it's fake, it's YouTube, whatever. Like, but for them, that's who they want to be because now that, that's, that's their idol. That's who they look up to. And we don't understand it because we're old and, that's just, and our back hurts and everything else. But we can do the same thing, All right? We do the same thing. We just phrase it a little differently. It just gets tweaked a little differently. We put our hope and our trust and we go, man, wouldn't that be awesome if they got an office? Or this person? It's like, ah, same exact thing. We just don't know them, right? It's the old cliche saying, like, be careful if you ever meet your hero. Why? Because they're human. They're just human beings, and they're going to mess up, and they're not going to live up to the expectation that you have set up for 
done. They're just not gonna do it. We have to understand that familiarity causes us and hurts us. And it, and it hurts us in this idea of honoring the men in our lives. And I'm telling you, if we want our country to be great, if we want our households to be great, if we want our men to be great, we have to begin to honor them. And again, this goes way beyond just the household. Organizations, schools, politics. And this issue of dishonor gets ingrained in every area of our lives. And I get it. The excuse is this, and this is the reason that I've given myself this. Right? I've said this to myself, things like, well, they don't believe what I believe. They don't have the stances that I do, and I, they can't finish a sentence better than me, so why should I bother trusting them? Why should I bother honoring them? You don't have to trust them, but you do have to honor them. Honor the position. Always honor the position. I told all my kids, no, it's Principal Jones, right? It's President this. It's not just a name. It speaks to how you view them and the attitude that you have to honor the position that God has put them in. It was one of the things that drove me so mad a couple years ago after the election cycle happened and President Biden got inaugurated is it was people were six months later, nine months later, were still hanging out to hope that somebody else was going to walk into the office. And you're like, what are you talking about? It's President Biden. Acknowledge it. That maybe God put somebody in office that maybe you liked or maybe you didn't like. But God put him there for a reason or for a purpose. Do you know what it is? I don't know, but he does. He's bigger than I am. I mean, come on, the whole book of Habakkuk was essentially what we just talked about the last couple of weeks was them saying, we're kind of bad. We're not as bad as these people, so why are you letting the Babylonians take over the bad people? Or the not-so-bad people. They're worse than we are. What's going on? And we have to understand, we have to honor people in authority. Honor people around you. Honor those people around, from your dad, your husband, your boss, your teacher, your leaders, even pastors. And I get it. Sometimes it stinks. Sometimes you don't want to. Sometimes I don't want to. But if we want Jesus to do what Jesus does best, we better do the things that he's calling us to do. And when Jesus walked into his hometown and they dishonored him and didn't believe him because of the familiarity in his life, careful that we're not doing the exact same thing. You can watch every video clip known to man. They can be skewed any, any way they want. Do not dishonor people in authority. All right? Do not do it. I get it. Election, it's not even election season. It will be soon. And it's just going to get worse. But as Christians, can we start to honor people who are at least running for office? Can we just sit back and complain? At least they have the courage and the guts to do it no matter what side of the office it is, it is on. But if we ever want God to bless this country again, we better start acting godly before we ever worry about who is in office. The second thing that happened was not just their familiarity, was there was offenses. So they were offended at him. They were offended. And we can get offended over things really easy. You know how I know? I can get offended over things that are really easy. That's how I know. Right? That's how I know. We can all get offended. Because the truth hurts. The truth hurts. Nobody likes to be told the cold hard truth. Nobody likes that. Nobody's like, you know what? I want to be told all my faults so I can fix them. Nobody signs up for that. But sometimes it's needed. And that's sometimes why being why pastoring can be so difficult. Because if you truly preach this entire Bible, not this, right, you're going to essentially offend somebody every single week. Why? Because you're speaking truth, godly biblical truth, and we've all sinned and fallen short. So there's things in our lives that all need to be worked on. And when it gets pointed out, it stinks. It hurts. It's not fun. But it is true. It is true. Wherever you are, honor the leadership that is in place. And what, what happens in church circles, what can happen, is that we begin to get things pointed out to us biblically. 
I mean, we don't like it. We don't like it. You you want to you want to really see what it talks about how we should treat our politicians? Read Peter. Right? Read the books of Peter. See what he has to say. How much he talks about submitting to him and praying for him. We don't like to hear those things. Because so many times we want to see things through the lens of being an American before the lens of being a Christian. See things through the lens of being a Christian first and foremost. You know, we like different passages of Scripture. We like to claim them for ourselves. But Psalm, like one of the ones of Psalms has got all these little one-line sayings and it's awesome. One of them that we like to say for ourselves that we don't like for other people is like your grace and your mercies are new every morning. And we like to read these things and go, see, every day is a new chance. Every day I can start over. Every day. I, is a new start. I can start over. I can redo it because I don't have to live in the past. I don't have to live in yesterday. Today's a new day. And it's awesome. Can you do that for the people in your leadership? Can you do that for your boss? Your co-workers? Your spouse? Let's bring it back into the house. How, how do guys function most of the time? How do we get their attention, so to speak? Men, I'll say this, well, I'll be nice. We're like dogs, but nice dogs. In the sense of this, we're not the old dog who's like, you know, 15 years old that doesn't want to go for a walk that just bites everybody that walks in the house. Don't be that dog. You will get put out on the street. <laughs> like, right? Be the dog that's trainable, teachable, and absolutely loyal to death. Be that dog. And what you will find is when you are able to, with at least puppies, with dogs, is when you are able to train a dog, you're able to train them on not to bark and to sit and to stay and all this stuff, but you do it through treats, you do it through affection. But that dog, a good dog, will be loyal to death. They'll be loyal to death. We, you, can, you can see videos, right? You can go to see dog videos the other day because we went out in the woods and, and everything was about like mountain lions and bears attacking us and just all these things that never actually happened. But you're always scared of them because you see the one in the middle of video of like, you know, of it happening. By the way, I'm a little scared of mountain lions. That's just my thing. Bears I'm cool with, but mountain lions, you just never know what you're going to get. But because of that, it was like, well, look at this, right? You saw, we've seen videos of dogs chasing away bears. We've seen, like, you can see videos of, like, dogs, like, scaring away mountain lions. It's like, why? Because they're there to protect their owners. And so when we begin to honor men and do it authentically. So you can praise and give affection, but not authentically, and it doesn't mean anything. But when a spouse does it, from in a place of being authentic and caring, then a good man, a good husband, will stay loyal and protect them to the death. But we have to be authentic. Praising the person you're with should be an automatic thing, but unfortunately it's not. It's not anymore. Praising your spouse, praising somebody that you supposedly dedicated the rest of your life with isn't an automatic thing anymore. It should be, but it's it's not. It's not. It's like there's some point that comes along the side, you date, you get married, you do all this stuff, and at some point they just become like pals with you. And instead of hugging, you begin to like shake up and you're like, hey, good to see you. It's like that's not like don't give your spouse knocks. You know what I mean? Like that's that's not it. It should mean more. It has to come from a place of uh, true authenticism. But if we are dishonoring our spouses, if we're dishonoring them, and you can't be truly authentic with them from a place of dishonor, it will never, ever work. And men and women, we're different, and that's okay. God created us to be different, so we have to embrace the difference. Ruby started to figure this thing out. A couple weeks ago, we're driving. I remember we were driving what we were doing. I remember the second part of the story a lot better than the first part. But all I know 
Because I'll tell you the second part in a second. All I know is we're driving and she was venting about something. And all I remember is I'm sure I gave her out of this world good advice on how to solve every problem she came up with. Okay? Because that's what dads do. Now, I didn't even know I did this. Had no recollection of it whatsoever. Until a couple days later, and we're cleaning up dinner, I'm washing down the counter, and something happened, and Ruby goes, yeah, Dad tried to fix all the problems the other day when I was talking to him. And Tina goes, welcome to my life. And I'm over here scrubbing the table like, what are you talking about? I'm just hitting home runs left and right, solving everything under the sun. Just appreciate it for once. <laughs> Had no clue. I still don't even know what the issues were or the problem-solving skills. I just know. I was knocking them out of the park left and right. Like, let's go. I solved everything. Probably didn't, obviously. But in my head, I did. Why? Because we're just different. We're just different. Every time a guy hears a problem, we're like, gotta solve it. We're just different. But unless we embrace the differences, we will always be fighting. And if we don't honor our husbands and our wives for being different and being okay with them, being authentic with them, the differences will turn into offenses. And offenses will turn into hurts, and then we put real fences up, and we put real walls up, and the next thing you know, you're all signing paperwork because you're like, I'm out on this thing. Why? Because we started with this idea of dishonor. We didn't appreciate the differences above them and they turned into offenses. They turned into offenses. Look at this scripture. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1 says this. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment of the promise, that it may be well with you, that you may live long on earth. First off, if you're going to live a long time on earth, you want it to be well. Nobody wants to live to be 120 and be like, that was the worst 120 years ever. Okay, if that's the case, you want to be like, like dude, just send me to heaven on 46. I don't care. Heaven's great. Right? But you want to, if you're going to live on this earth, you want to live well. And it got, this verse got me thinking, because I always just read it as just, because it says kids and parents. Is it just the kids and parents? But what does it say? It says honor, honor. And here's what I'm finding. I'm finding that as a society, we shoot ourselves in the foot because we're not honoring those in authority in our lives. The reason why it was kids and parents, because parents are the ultimate authority in kids' lives. Whether or not your kids want that to be the case or not, it's a completely different discussion. But as a parent, you are the ultimate authority in your kids' lives. Not the government. Not the church. You are. Right? It is your job to teach your kids. Right? How you do that is up to you, but you better have conversations with your kids about everything in life that's called being a parent. Now, we've, had, we've had the birds and the bees talk with all of our kids before the school system ever will. Why? It's my job to teach them that kind of stuff, not the school system's job. It's my job to constantly impart biblical values into my kids. It's not the church's job. Now, it's great when they can come alongside and help and partner, but it's never their job alone. Ever. So parents are the ultimate authority in our kids' lives. That's why it says we better show honor where honor is due. That's the principle. That's the principle. Parents, lead by example. Every issue we have with the young generation that we can complain about and everything else boils down to, honestly, a respect and honor issue for those in authority. But guess what? They're learning by example. They're learning because they've watched their parents and their grandparents rip apart authority for years. For years. And then we expect them to walk into school and respect their teachers? Are you nuts? You do it first. Do it first. Lead by example. This is a promise from God. He put this story in there, at least I believe for a reason, to show that we have an attitude of dishonor it will hinder everything that God is wanting to do in our lives, in our homes, in our culture, in our society, and everything else. 
See, honoring those in authority and God's blessing you goes hand in hand. It's not just with parents and with kids. Dishonor kept Jesus in the flesh from doing what he did best. And I believe it's keeping marriages and families and churches and organizations from God blessing them the way that he wants to. Honor your husband. Honor your wife. The second thing that husbands need, that fathers need, is to be received. Matthew 10, chapter 10, verses 40 and 41, it says this. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive the prophet's reward. He who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And what does all this mean? To receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, what does it mean to receive? What is this? What I really think it means, it means to accept. Accept them. Not begrudgingly, but accept them as God's gift to you. Accept them as God's perfect gift. We really struggle with this when it comes to people that we don't agree with. I struggle with this with people I don't agree with. I can still honor the position even though I may not agree with them with some of the morality things. But to accept that person fully means to accept that person unconditionally. Unconditionally. Right? In the context of marriage, it would simply mean I accept them. I understand that if you're fault, I understand you're not perfect, but I accept you anyways. A couple of months ago, um, Pastor Jimmy Evans is a, is a pastor down in Texas, and someone he pulled up and I was listening to him talking. He's talking about wedding vows and how wedding vows, it's a covenant, it's not a contract. And, and a lot of times we, we look at weddings and marriages as contracts. Contracts have clauses in them. You do this, I do this. You do this, I do this. You come to these agreements, I come to this agreement, we're gonna meet in the middle, that's a contract. It's not marriage. Marriage is, is I accept you, it's God's gift to me, no matter what, through sickness and in health, through death do we part. That's a covenant. It's an agreement that says, I accept you despite all of your flaws. Right? I accept you. No matter if the conditions get better or the conditions get worse, I accept you. See, marriages will never work with conditions. So I hate prenups because you're putting conditions you're changing the terms. You're changing the foundation of what marriage is. Marriage is not a contract. It is a covenant. But it only works when you do it unconditionally. It only works if you're going to look at somebody and say, I'm going to honor you unconditionally. I know you ain't that great. I know you've got your faults and you mess up and you're this and you're that. Okay, cool. But do you accept them that God's put them there for a reason and for a purpose? Even if we don't understand what that purpose and reason is both inside your household and outside your household? So maybe, you know, depending on the situation, sometimes it's harder to, to honor your husband. Sometimes it may be honor your father. Sometimes it may be harder to honor those outside the house. It may be really easy to honor your spouse, a father, a husband. But it's really hard to honor the city council. And speak well. It just depends on your situation. This is the principle. Until you accept someone as God's perfect gift to you, that person cannot be released to do what God has intended for them, him or her in your life. Whatever that is. So ask yourself big picture. You know, what what are people that are in some way authority figures? Whether whether it's within like politics in the state or the city, or maybe in your own home and your own workplace, like I, I just I have never fully accepted them in that position before. I, I don't I don't want to accept them in that position because I see all the things wrong with them. And it's not and it's not saying there aren't all those things wrong. It's not ignoring them. 
and say, this is their title, this is the position, and I'm going to honor the position that they are in because God has called me to honor the authority in my life, and you're my boss, so I'm going to honor you. That is hard to do. Because when you work alongside people, you get to know them. When you live with people, you get to know them really well. And we think we get to know people now because everybody's personal information is out on social media and everybody's writing articles about this or this or this or this or whatever it may be and we think we're all experts at everything. But we're not. We're not. If you're married, your spouse is God's perfect gift for you. Your spouse is God's perfect gift for you. And here's what's interesting. We think that God designed things to make us happy. No, God designs things to make us more like him. So what if God doesn't design marriage and never intended marriage to make us happy? He designed it to become more like him. To have something to come alongside of us that was point things out. And we both serve each other and we both have the attitude of saying, hey, we're gonna become better. And we're gonna grow closer to Jesus. Then the closer we get to God, the more we become like Christ happier we will be. But we have to develop it. See, we have to understand, we have to fully receive people in authority positions in our lives. But it looks different. It looks different. We have different roles. A man's number one need is honor, but that looks different in different places, right? You don't want your workplace to treat you the way your spouse treats you. That wouldn't work. Right? At work, you want pay raise, continued education, time off. You want to feel appreciated. You want someone to know that they're sticking up for you, that somebody has your back, all those things. At home, it even changes. Right? It even changes. How, how kids talk and obey and listen and attitude plays a huge factor into whether or not they're honoring their parents or not. Because it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. And we've all been guilty of saying the right thing in the wrong way. Most of the time that's why parents can actually talk their kids through this because we're, we're just as guilty of it, if not more. We just have more years and experience than they do. <laughs> we don't want to admit that to them, but it's true. Right? And yes, in marriage, within a husband and a wife, a lot of times husbands are received can play itself out in physical ways. But it, it's meant as a way of honoring each other as spouses to say, I'm all in. I'm all in. Right? You, don't want you, you don't want to come home one day and your spouse to go, guess what, I got you like a continued education classes, here you go. No, you, that's not what you want. So it looks different depending on the roles. But you're saying the same principle, you're saying, this is your God's perfect gift to me. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to give everything I got to you. Do we trust that God knows what he's doing? He's placing authority figures in places, even if we don't understand it, even, even if we don't like it. Are we going to honor them based on the positions that they are in? If we want God's blessing, we better do things God's way. So do you want God's blessing? Only you can answer that. How do, receive, how do we receive God? How do we do this? How does this happen? See, until you receive Jesus for who he is, the son of God, you can never experience all he's going to do in your life. Jesus went to their hometown and he was familiar with them. They took offense at him. They never received him for who he was. They looked at everything else around the fact that they never looked at who he was. And until you submit your life to Jesus and go, you are the Son of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, we will never receive the blessings that God wants in our lives because we're pushing him away and keeping him from afar. God's like, you have to receive me fully and unconditionally. It's a lot easier when it comes to Jesus. He has no faults. That's simple. That's pretty easy. Like, Jesus, you're pretty awesome. Everybody else, we're just so-so. But it's Jesus. John 1 12 says this, but as many received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. Until you receive him fully unconditionally, 
you can kill yourself a child of God. If you receive your spouse as God's perfect gift to you, if you do it, then God can release all of them into being one. But if we keep pushing away, we keep dishonoring, and they'll never be the people that God has called them to be in our lives. And we are the ones that are shooting ourselves in the foot because we're doing it to ourselves. Honoring people in your life today that deserve to be honored, and watch what God can do. Watch it. Now, is it easier to honor people that are worthy of being honored? Absolutely, 100%. Way easier for me, too. But we're human. And we have our faults, and we have our mistakes, and we remember them all, and it makes it hard and it makes it difficult to do. But we have got to honor the people in our lives. And when we let God in, we let Jesus in, and we honor him, we accept him, and receive him for everything he has, he'll tear down the walls, he'll do the work, he'll come into your life and bring love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and justice and self-control. That's our witness, by the way. All right, if you want to know what's the easiest way to witness, what's the easiest way to show the world who you are, just look at the fruit of the Spirit and go, that's how I need to act. Right there. That's how I need to act. When we honor and receive the people in our lives, even when they're not perfect, God will honor and bless us in return. And it releases Jesus to be all who Jesus is in our lives. I can't imagine Jesus, that, that story, him coming back into town, into a city that he, he was in, that he was running in, and going, I'm so I want to change your life. And I'm going, you're not God. The heartbreak. Like the heartbreak he must have felt. Like, I was the best kid that was ever here. I never sinned once. I worked hard. I did everything I could. I did it the right way. I treated people with honor and kindness and respect and everything he had to go through. I wanted to show up in his hometown and be like, seriously, man, all I can do is heal a couple headaches. What do we do? Because he did a little. Isn't that so awesome, though? In the middle of this dishonor, in the middle of the offense, he's like, ah, he just helped a couple people today. That's all he had. So the question that we end with today on this Father's Day is simply this. Who do you need to honor that you are not honoring? Are you setting the example at your house for your kids? Who do you need to honor that you're not honoring? Is it somebody inside your house? Is it somebody outside your house? We have a society that loves to rip apart, loves to dishonor people. It is fun. Because it makes us feel better about ourselves. And the church world is really good at it. And we're not going to ever see anything change until the church world begins to change first. Until Christians act like Christians and we honor those in authority, and we pray for them more than we rip them apart. But God, we are handcuffing ourselves and we are shooting ourselves in the foot. Don't shoot your, home, your house in your own foot. I want this to happen. I want this to happen. I want this to happen. Honor them first and watch what God does. Stop shooting yourself in the foot. You can pray all you want. God's like, I'm trying to tell you what you have to do. Just listen to me. I'm pretty good. I kind of know what I'm talking about. I am God. I kind of got this thing figured out. So who do you need to honor that you are not honoring today? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this story that you gave us to help illustrate the idea of honor and dishonor. Lord, I pray for all the fathers today. We are more fragile than what we ever want to admit to. Help us to know that you're walking beside us each and every day and that we can be the godly men that you have called us to be. We can lead our families spiritually. We can do it. We need to do it. In fact, it is our God-given role and responsibility to do so. 
but I pray for all of us that we will take a good, hard, long look into our hearts and into our lives and ask ourselves, who are we openly and maybe behind the scenes dishonoring today? Because as Christians, we're called to lead by example. We're called to be set apart. We're not called to act like everybody else. We're called to be holy. We're called to be set apart. Help us to be set apart how we talk about people that we disagree with. Help us to pray for people more than we rip them apart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless. Men, do not forget. Go grab your knife sitting out there in the foyer. Have a great one, guys. We will see you next week.